it's a nine week series that we're doing on the subject of getting out and staying out of debt. I'm so glad that uh, not only the Facebook, but each of you all that are here tonight uh, could be here to join us. And so let's get ready to hear a word from God. Let's go before God in prayer. Father, we just thank you for this, another opportunity to minister to these your people. We know that not one word from you is void of power. Build our hearts and our minds to you to transform the way that we think. Renew our minds with your word. We thank you, Father, in advance for that which will be done in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. Open with me in your Bible, if you would, to the book of Romans, chapter 13. And I want to look at verse 8 and 9 again as our foundation for this message. Um, this is something that I've learned uh, many years ago, something that I've ministered on before. Um, but as I go back into it again, it just amazes me how powerful these truths are from God's word. In the book of Romans, the 13th chapter, verse number 8, is our foundation. It says this. Owe no man anything except to love one another. For he who loves another hath fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet, and if there be any other commandment, They are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So what's very interesting here is God says in verse number eight that we are to owe no man anything but to love one another. One day I was at a conference, a, a meeting, a, a minister's event, or it was, I believe it was just a believer's convention, and I heard Brother Kenneth Copeland ministering on this particular verse, the revelation that he received from God. Early on in his Christian walk, he was reading Romans 13, and he had made a promise to God that whatever he saw in the word, that he would obey it, no matter what. And so when he came across this verse, it stopped him in the tracks. I believe he went and talked to his wife, and because it was just so beyond what he had experienced in life. In other words, in his lifetime, he had debt and accumulated debt, and everything they did in life was based on borrowing and paying it back. And in America today, uh, we are a culture that's built and based on credit. Uh, the United States of America has trillions of dollars in debt, and there was a great concern because we, as a nation, even lost our credit, you know, our top-notch AAA credit rating. Everything society does, in other words, is through borrowing. And so it was in Kenneth Copeland's life. And so he read this, and what this meant, what this meant was that uh, he would owe no man anything. It meant that he would not borrow anything from anybody. And that's a big decision if you would ever make it. And that's essentially what we're talking about in this series. We're talking about you and I getting out of debt and staying out of debt forever. Is it possible for us as the children of God to live our lives debt-free? I mean, it, it should be at least a dream that, that we could get to the place in life where we owned everything and didn't have to borrow for anything. Well, that dream doesn't have to be a dream. It can actually be a reality. Dave Ramsey, who's well-known as one of the number one talk shows in America, um, he has a financial peace university. And what they basically teach, what he teaches and his team teaches in the financial peace university is he helps people get out of debt and stay out of debt. It's the same thing Brother Copeland has been preaching and believing and acting on in his life. And it's what I've caught hold of in my own personal life and have been working towards and striving towards. And I believe God's given me this message to help you. So tonight, the specific focus is <clears throat> step number one on get out and stay out. Step number one is you've got to consider yourself 
dead today. Consider yourself dead today. So tonight we're going to look at this stats on how to get out and stay out of debt. I don't know if you know this, but 78% of all Americans live from paycheck to paycheck. They're literally one financial event away from a crisis. In other words, if something kept them from working and, and, and you know getting that next check, they are going to be in a bind of some kind, not able to meet their obligations. And the reason why that it, it's kind of compound, but the number one reason why so many Americans, almost eight out of ten Americans, live in that place of one paycheck to the next is because of debt. The second reason is because there's no savings. You know, we don't save. We, we use our credit or our credit cards for what we should be using our savings accounts for. So this is real. And it, it is the number one reason behind the debt problem. So the goal of this series is very simple, to help you get out and stay out of debt. You know, this is not something where you can bring debt under control in your life and then eventually get to the place where it's more manageable. What we're challenging you to do is exactly what uh, Dave Ramsey is challenging the nation to do, and that is to get out and to stay out. And there's some specific spiritual principles that you can apply that will cause you to walk in that level of freedom. So our approach is first from a spiritual perspective. Um, what does the Word of God teach about debt or borrowing? What does God, you know, thank God for people and, you know, thank God for our pastors and, and other leaders. I can remember specifically that when I heard um, Brother Copeland come to, to a church where I was attending and he preached that message, I can also remember the pastor getting up behind that and saying, well, it would be a sin for Brother Copeland to borrow money because that's what he preached. You know, he preached that to him. Borrowing was a sin because the Bible says not to owe any man anything. And then the pastor got up and said it would be a sin for him to borrow. But in and of itself, it's not a sin. So what we're doing in this series is rather than letting other people shape our perspective or our mind about the subject, we're allowing God and God's word to frame our thinking. And this is so critical. What does God have to say about the subject of debt? Because if we can see it from the word of God, then we have every obligation to obey. It. But if it's just your opinion versus my opinion, then we do as we do. Amen? Amen. So, <clears throat> uh, so, so far in this series, we've learned, uh, we've, we've actually looked at two questions. And based on how you answer these questions, we'll determine if you will ever get out and stay out of debt. The first question that we looked at in this series, number one, is simply this, is it a sin to borrow? And I want you to ask that question. And I don't want you to come to a quick answer. Is it a sin when you sit across from a desk to borrow money to pay for your education? Is it a sin? In the eyes of God, is it a sin when you sit across from a desk at the uh, insurance office to borrow against or for the insurance. You know, it's basically credit for that, and you're agreeing to pay this full amount. Is it a sin to borrow for transportation? For after all, you know, we need transportation in order to get to work. It's a necessity of life. Is it a sin to borrow to buy a house or to build a new home for your family? Is it a sin to go in debt? That was the first question that we asked. And what I'm saying to you tonight is based on your answer to that question, based on how you interpret what God has said in Scripture, it will determine whether debt will continue to be a part of your life or whether you'll get out of it and stay out of it forever. The second question that we ask is similar, but it has a different emphasis. The second question that we asked, which was last week's message, which was, what if debt was a sin? So, yeah, there's no scripture in the Bible that specifically says debt is a sin. Now, you do have several scriptures that could be interpreted as a clear 
instruction not to borrow and that violating that instruction will actually indeed be sin. Let me give you a few because the whole series is based on the word of God. Well, one in Romans chapter 13 verse 8, it says point blank. Don't owe anybody anything but the Bible. So if you owe the bank and if you owe your brother and if you owe, you know, if you owe, then you are absolutely going against the commandment of God. Now check this out. So when you look at Romans 13, 8, in its context, he's talking about commandments. He's not talking about opinions and good ideas or good advice. He's telling them. He says, uh, in Romans chapter 13, verse 8, Oh, no man, but, but, you, but you love enough. For this, thou shalt, you know, not commit, uh, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not, you know, all of these are thou shalt not. And then he says, and if there be a, a, a greater commandment than that, then make sure that, you know, in, in other words, the context is as if this is a command from God to owe no man anything. But then how about Deuteronomy chapter 5, where it says that you shall lend unto many nations, and you shall not borrow. Literally says, you shall not borrow. Wow. How much more play can you get? How can we frame or shape our minds in a different wise, uh, in a different way to think that borrowing is okay to God where we're concerned? When he says as a commandment, thou shalt not borrow. And I know this is really challenging because for all of us, at some point in our life, we've gone into debt. We've borrowed something. And as a result, it makes us to think, well, you know, well, maybe it's not a sin. Well, I've got another example, which is Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 12. It's a repeat, but yet it's a command again. The second time he says it, you shall lend unto many nations, but you shall not borrow. You shall not borrow. You know, the scripture doesn't say borrow, that if you borrow, it's a sin, but neither does it say that marijuana is a sin. Does that mean it's okay to smoke marijuana? But there are scriptures that say that what you do with your body you know, that your body is the temple. So you, you can get the idea that if I do this, I'm going against, really, the spirit of the law. Right. Amen. Mm -hmm. How about the scripture that says in Proverbs 22 and 7, that the rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Right. Yeah, I know that doesn't say that borrowing is a sin, but what it does say is that if you ever put yourself, whether it be for a mortgage, or whether it be for a vehicle, or whether whatever, if you ever put yourself in a borrower's position, you become servant to that person. How about Matthew chapter 6? Jesus says, no man can serve two masters. Either he'll hold to one and hate the other, he'll, you know, love one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Well, when you put yourself in a borrower's position, you're essentially putting yourself in a position where you've got two masters and you vacillate between the two. So this is a real challenge. So many don't operate at this level of conviction. I'm so thankful to God for Dave Ramsey and others that, that carry the baton of God's word and say, get out of debt and stay out of it. Believe to be able to pay off your home and, and never borrow again. Believe to pay off your car and never borrow again. You know, for, for young people, believe to go to college and have your college tuition paid for. For young people, I mean, my first introduction to credit life, and from then till this day, it's affected my life in one way or another, was on a college campus. I remember I was in Tallahassee, Florida, on the campus, and they had little tables set up and stations. And I got my first credit card. And you know what I found in my life? Every time I've gotten a credit card or charge card, my spending always has found the limit. <laughs> always. If there was a $300 limit, somewhere or another when I was good and I paid it off. And then at some point, something came up, a car repair, a trip, uh, an emergency of some kind came up, and I found myself right there at that limit. I literally have then gotten consolidation loans. Well, I took all of these little bitty loans that I bought a TV on and bought a car.
car and, and I ran it into one debt consolidation loan and now they reduced my payment. Now, in the credit world, I qualify for more debt <laughs> because I got the debt to income ratio working for me and what started out to be a debt consolidation to get completely out of debt just expanded it and I ended up in more debt. I challenge you, really open your heart to the word of God and to the will of God and get debt out of your life once and for all. Um, I'm going to be sharing these powerful principles over these next seven weeks, and I believe they'll, they'll bless you. So let's focus on what we're focusing on tonight. Tonight is step one. We talked about two questions. Is it a sin to borrow? I'm not going to answer that question. I'm going to let you get before God and decide. And what if sin was, what if? That was a sin. What would that change in your life? If it was, if you found out that borrowing indeed was a sin, would that change anything? Would, how would it make you feel the next time you, you went to do something and you, if you saw it for yourself as that? And I believe those two, the answers to those two questions are actually going to shape whether you ever get out or not. So step number one is you've got to consider yourself dead to debt. Where do you get that from, Pastor Stan? I'm glad you asked. So turn with, you, turn with me, if you would, to the book of Romans, chapter 6. This chapter, we spent some time last week looking at several verses and I exchanged debt for sin in that particular passage to emphasize a strong point of this teaching. So when you look at Romans chapter 6 <clears throat> and you begin in about verse 11 actually I'm going to start with verse 10 tonight. It says here for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. So everywhere in this passage where we see the word sin, I want to substitute, just for teaching purposes, the word debt. Because the question that we base this teaching on is, is it a sin to ball? Is it a sin to be in debt? Or to, to borrow, I'll say it that way. Or what if borrowing was a sin? Well, that means we could exchange it and it would work. And essentially what we're teaching, to, teaching you tonight is in order for us to get out and stay out, we are going to have to die to debt. In other words, we're going to have to consider ourselves to be dead to debt. So watch this. He says, for the death that he died, he died to debt once and for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. What I'm challenging you to do is to die to debt once and for all. So whatever amount of debt that you have today, don't increase it. Be dead to it, pay that debt off. And by being dead to it, that means you'll never put yourself back in that bowing position ever again. So watch this, verse 11. He says, likewise, you also... Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, substitute death. So he says, in the same way that Jesus died, he died to sin once and for all. In the same way, as I substituted, I'm challenging you to reckon. The word reckon there is an old English word, um, to consider. Consider yourself dead to this thing called sin, or for us, consider yourself to be dead to debt. If you're going to get out and stay out of debt, you're going to have to take this first step. And that is, you're going to have to consider yourself dead to it. And, and we'll talk about that in a minute. I just want to keep reading because I want to illustrate what does it mean or what does it look like when you're dead to something or when you're dead to debt. So keep going. He says, likewise, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to debt, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let debt reign, verse 12, in your mortal body or in your life, that you should obey it in its lust. And that's exactly what happens where debt is concerned. Number one, debt reigns over 
themselves that have engrossed themselves in it. And it literally rules your life. Most people don't go to work because they want to. They go to work because they got to. Why? Right? Because if they don't go to work, then something that they borrowed is going to come due. And they're going to lose that thing. They're going to lose that house. They're going to lose that vehicle. And so they don't go to work because they want to. They go to work because they got to. What does that mean? Who's, who's in charge? God is in charge. Maybe I can say it to masters. You go to work. Well, Pastor, I can't do this. Pastor, I can't. Why? Well, because I'm going to be dead. And because of that, I've got to go to work. What would your life look like if you had no debts? If your house was paid for, if your cars were paid for, You'd go to work with a whole different attitude. You know, one of the things that David Ramsey highlights in the Financial Peace University, he tells of the freedom that you have. Now, all of a sudden, you don't get all wrapped up in what the supervisor is doing. If the fiscal supervisor goes off, or, you know, you're there not because you got to be, you're there because you want to be. And if you don't want to be, you don't have no debt to, to, to hold over your head, then you can leave the head. I'll see y'all later. One lady said last week, deuces. <laughs> <laughs> so the question, what would your life be like if you, on the job, you walk off in the heartbeat? Why? I don't have to put up with this. Amen. So debt, if you allow it, will rule your life. It'll tell you when you can take a vacation and when you can't. When you can have a bigger house and when you can't. When you can have a better car and when you can't. Who then is God in that scenario? And it's the very reason why God said don't do it. Now put yourself in that position because you become servant to that thing rather than to him. He said you'll have no other gods before me. He says likewise reckon yourselves to be dead indeed, I'm adding, Debt, but alive to God. What does that mean? That means rather than going to the bank to get a better house, go to God to get a better house. Rather than going to the, the, the car place to get a better car, go to God and get a better car. What challenges us in that moment is is this mountain bigger than the God that we serve? Can we speak to the mountain and command it to be? I mean, it's, it's like standing at the foot of the mountain to believe God for $350,000 cash. To go and buy that house. It's like David against Goliath to think in your mind that you can somehow come up with $35,000, $50,000 cash to go buy the car that you want to drive. But when they say we can work that out for six years with some easy monthly payments, I mean, you've got, you've got a good job and you just sign right here and become servant to us, then you can live that dream today. This is powerful, y'all. And I pray to God, help me, anoint me to minister his word with such an anointing that, that you get it and that you understand and that you can put yourself in a position to obey what the word of God says. If you're going to get out and stay out, step number one is you've got to consider yourself dead to death. We're going to look at that. <clears throat> Thirteen. Romans 6.13 says, And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, or don't present your members or parts of your life as instruments of unrighteousness to debt. When you present yourself to debt, you're saying, Here I am, you can use me. And that's what the bankers do. They use you to make themselves rich. Come on, that's what the lender does. They use you for their benefit. And he says, don't do that. Don't present parts of your life. My hand is a member of my body. My limb is a member of my body. And he says, don't present the members of your body to unrighteousness unto sin or for us. Don't, don't present parts of your life. In other words, don't have a part of your life where God can speak, and then the financial part of your life where, you know, you this, and then this other physical part of your life. He says, don't present parts of your life in a negative way. Present yourself to God. What does he say? But present yourself to God being alive from the dead and your members as instrument, as instruments of righteousness to God. I thought this was very interesting. Financial institutions call their services and programs instruments. For, for example, um, 
you know, certain kinds of accounts. That's an instrument that you can use to grow your retirement or an instrument. This is another instrument that we use this for this person or uh, for this purpose or insurance for this person. So notice these words, members and instruments. I'm going to bring that up back, back up in a moment. But let's keep reading. Verse 14. Is this good tonight? Yeah. Amen. Amen. So verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law but under grace. So we're flipping it. For debt shall not have dominion over you. How many of y'all ought to say amen to that? Amen. Debt shall not, it shall not. And I declare over your life, debt as a result of you getting a hold of this teaching and deciding to get out and stay out, debt shall not have dominion over you. It won't call the shots. It won't tell you how long you have to stay on that job. It won't tell you what you can have and what you can't have. You and I will get to the place where we can live our lives financially free as God has designed us to be. Amen? Amen. He says, for, for debt shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but you are under grace. You are under God giving you what you don't deserve. Man, that is good. In other words, you should have in life the things that God gives you that you don't deserve. And if you let the grace of God rule in your life, rather than trying to make a way on your own, you'll experience the life that God has, the good life, the better life that he's designed. Amen. We're almost done. Whew. Verse 15, what then, shall we, shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? Certainly not. In other words, shall we go in debt because we can? And, you know, it's, 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 it's not, you know, because we can? You know, God doesn't force you to do what he wants you to do. Shall we then allow debt to be in our lives just because we have that, that freedom to do? He says, no, so the grace can come about? No, certainly not. What does he say? Verse 16, and I'll close with this. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves, yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? So in other words, Whomever you yield yourself to obey, mm -hmm. you become their servant. Right. If you yield yourself to the bank right. to obey as a servant because you borrow, then you become their servant. Mm -hmm. So don't put yourself in that position. You say, well, Pastor Stan, how do I get out? You've got to consider yourself dead to death. I'm going to close with this illustration. I want you to imagine there's this guy. He passed. And... Um, Man, he's laying up in the coffin, and there's this lady that comes down the aisle to pay her respects, and sure enough, she's got on some wonderfully smelling perfume, beautiful dress, and she's, you know, a really sharp lady. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> and she leans over into the casket, and oh, she's crying. And just seems like, man, that this... Is he moved by that? No, not at all. Why? Because he's dead to that. <laughs> <laughs>
and you want to know how to get out of it, then take step number one. And that is consider yourself dead today. I have to make one of the most difficult decisions that I've had to make in a long time. I'm going through this Financial Peace University process and the, the second lesson, they had a placectomy. <laughs> What's that? They took out their credit cards and they for these years that I've gotten a hold of the revelation that Kenneth Copeland preached that, you know, the Bible says, so get that. I mean, all of the debt to my name in life is an American Express card with about $10,000 on it. My entire life. The reason why I drive a 2004 vehicle, if you've ever wondered, is because I don't believe in borrowing. I won't go to a dealership and sign to buy a vehicle. I didn't know that leasing is just as bad as borrowing to buy it because it's a lease. You give it back and you're done. You don't owe anything on it. So be it. But then I, I go through this Financial Peace University and he is absolutely against leasing. So now we got to go get Mama a hoopty. <laughs> Turn that lease in. And, 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 and you'll see that we're driving, the, you know, these old vehicles, you know. What's going on? We're getting it out and we're keeping it out. We're not compromising. We're not saying, well, if we can manage it well, then we'll be okay. No, we see something here and we see something that this man has used to help millions of people really experience financial peace. And that's to get out of debt. So I got some big purchases that, that we were planning to make. And it's become a part of my life. I've yielded a part of my life to this instrument of debt called American Express. And so I'm about to have a plastectomy tonight <laughs> and cut up this card. And do you know what the biggest threat or thought that comes to my mind? How am I going to function without that? And you know what's offensive about that thought? Is it because it reduces God as if his hand is too short wow. to come through when I need him. If I cut this up, this card and cancel this, and something comes to the home and to the family that's bigger than my account, then what do I have? The answer is God. Yeah. I got God. No. And my faith in God is all I need. Mm -hmm. I challenge you. If you're serious about it, we're going to be back here again next week. And I hope to see you then. God bless you. We'll see you next time.